Так. Чи всіх все добре з перекладом? Я буду модерувати українською. Тут таке свідоме рішення. Можу англійською, але українською трошки краще розумію, що не менше абревіатури з роботою організацій, яких я не знайома. Тому я буду українською. Чи у всіх працює переклад на англійську? Чи він вас задовольняє? Є переклад? Окей, добро. Є контакт. Ну тоді ми маємо 5 хвилин пізніше, і це дуже добре. Маємо півтори години, годину 25 на обговорення теми. Ми сьогодні не будемо мати презентацій. Ми сьогодні будемо працювати в форматі дискусії, в форматі обговорення. В принципі, ми говоримо про тематику і навіть назва цієї тематики, якщо хтось спостерігав за програмою довго, то він міг побачити, що вона змінювалася в процесі. І вона змінювалася від назви про кризу дії міжнародних інституцій до посилення міжнародної присутності в Україні і про те, як міжнародні актори можуть сприяти відновленню миру та стабілізації країні. Тому що ми розуміємо, що ми говоримо не тільки про кризу, але й про те, що ми можемо робити з цим. І сьогоднішній наш круглий стіл, він якраз і буде переходити від е, формату про те, а що ж ми бачимо в реальності, тобто як діють міжнародні інституції. Далі будемо говорити про те, навіть як, як українське суспільство сприйняло дію різних міжнародних інституцій, е, їх, їх реакцію на війну. І далі перейдемо взагалі до обговорення мандатів різних організацій і про те, а що ж можна зробити для того, щоб ця дія або покращувалася, або може, не знаю, закрити все. Сьогодні це ж те, теж такий контекст звучав ці два дні, тому ми будемо говорити і про мандати, і про різні можливості для нас, і для суспільства європейського, і українського. Отже, з нами сьогодні... Шестеро людей, тобто є з нами також є з України наша колега одна, але по черзі. Отже, з нами є Андре Хертель, він та, представляє SYP з Берліну, От, трошки докладніше про себе розкаже також. З нами є Андрес Вітковський, який є аналітиком з Центру міжнародних миротворчих операцій з Німеччини. Нами є Міла Леонова, вона якраз представляє Карітас Донецьк в Дніпрі. Це якраз для того, щоб побачити, як працюють міжнародні організації на місцях. Ну, що вона також координує зараз багато ООНівських зустрічей на місці. От, е, з нами також Ентоні Форман, керівник програм е, з Європи та Південного Кавказу з Peaceful Change. І е, Ольга Котюк, вона ж Корабльова, експертка в галузі безпеки, соціальної згуртованості та подолання наслідків збройних конфліктів. Е, я модерую Ганна Гуменюк, я також є менеджеркою програм з миробудування в Карітас України і також знайома з, щонайменше з гуманітарною дією, з миробудівничою дією міжнародних організацій, тому буду пробувати поєднувати модерування і мій власний внесок теж. Отже, на вітальне слово і на загальне, тобто ну, ми окреслили все, і по суті, насправді, є повна свобода про те, про що би ви хотіли почати говорити, і далі будемо від цього рухатися. Хто би хотів почати? Я так в школі. Так, ну, я бачу Ентоні біля мене, тому, напевно, так і почнемо. Дякую дуже багато. Я думаю, що перше, що я Uh, that, that it's important to say, I think, is to react to some of the things that were said yesterday. And one, I think what, one of the things which perhaps needs to be emphasized is that the international community hasn't faced anything like this since the end of the previous war. I think that was implicit in a lot of the things that were said, but it wasn't absolutely expressly said that this is an international war that was precisely the sort of thing that the present UN system is what was supposed to prevent. And, and what does that mean? It means that the practices that the international community has developed in the last uh, 50 years, and some of them are extremely well developed and tested in all sorts of um, contexts and circumstances, have not been tested in this way and uh, require quite a lot of reflection, adaptation, um, innovation, um, but maybe reflection, I think, is, is the most important thing. Um, I think for, for everybody who's at this conference, um, 
it's probably clear what's at stake in terms of the survival of the international system at all, or the, 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 the continuation of the international norms, which, um, which more or less hold things together. Um, um, it, it's not necessarily clear to people outside in broader societies. And I think, you know, people, uh, people like myself who are outside of Ukraine, but try to be advocates for Ukraine. Um, probably feel that we've been involved in a lot of discussions that we really shouldn't be having. You know, it, it, it is quite clear, but 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 it is important uh, to continue the making the argument. Um, but you know, it's internationals who are coming into Ukraine with a set of practices in a new environment um, have also. And, and, you know, I'm, I'm not saying this in any kind of blaming sort of way, we can see how um, they may have damaged trust towards international communities more broadly um, through some of the things that happened. And we, we've heard some of the examples that were described yeah, yesterday. I'm sure everybody knows about the Amnesty International. Um, there's uh, so, some frustration about um, some of the statements of the Red Cross. There was frustrations about the way some um, agency of the UN system have been uh, have been working and uh, and so on. And um, the, um, the the w one very hard fact that we have to say, you know, if you look at all of this context, is that a lot of these organisations have pretty much been working as should be expected because this is a crisis of a completely different level that um, haven't worked. Um, and I think that's quite a hard thing to hear. And you, you, know, and you can say, well, if the, it, what, what you're saying is that the system doesn't work and therefore it needs to be torn down and rebuilt or something like that. But, that, but that's, not, that's not what I'm saying at all. Um, there, I, I think a, a frustrating thing to see from the outside you know, is that some of these things that have damaged the, the standing of international um, agencies in Ukraine were at the same time actually also avoidable. Um, we could see that, you know, if somebody comes in on a kind of autopilot and say, well, you know, we stand behind impartiality or neutrality or some aspect of, of that kind of word, you know, you, you can understand that when you're dealing with a kind of civil war or another type of international upheaval, um, you can more or less um, understand uh, what, what that means. Um, but when you're dealing with an international war, you know, well, neutrality with respect to what are we talking about? Neutrality with respect to the parties? No, I, that, that, you could see how that can be very problematic. You can look at the principle of working together with local authorities, for example, as a, as a basis for good practice, for sustainable impact, uh, and so on. Um, well, so when you're talking about um, in occupied areas, does that mean we're talking about, you know, working in partnership with the occupying forces? Yeah, we, we can all understand how these, this is extremely problematic, um, to put it very, very lightly. Um, the, the, what, what I wanted to kind of input into this general conversation is, is that there are also practices which I think are not as widely known as, uh, as, as should be that can kind of inject a, a corrective into, into this context. And, and I know that it's been in the discussion among international and, and national, probably more about national organizations in Ukraine uh, since 2014, which is about conflict sensitivity. And um, and, and I just wanted to make a couple of points about conflict sensitivity because it's one of these things which seems to be instantly understandable because the, the words are very simple. It's about being sensitive to conflict and responsive to these things. But actually it's a little bit more complicated than that. And, um, I, I, and I think like a, a more consistent understanding of what we're talking about can help the environment in general. Number one, and I, I talk about this as a practice which has been established since for 20 years, really, I think, uh, since at least 2000. Number one, conflict sensitivity is for us, the internationals. It is not something that is an obligation, you can say, for Ukrainians. It is something that is developed as a practice that international organizations who are working in fragile con uh, contexts have to do. Uh, it, it's some, it, you know, this is quite well established in the agenda for aid effectiveness. Um, Number two is, well, what does it mean um, have to do? Well, it is a practice. It's not like a characteristic of somebody. You can't talk, uh, at least in this professional sense, of a specific person being conflict sensitive. 
Um, we, we can talk about, you know, a person can be politically sensitive or culturally sensitive or generally empathic. And all of that is important in order to implement conflict sensitivity. But conflict sensitivity is a set of practices which are consistently applied by an organization. So it's a commitment to a particular way of work. And, um, and going back to my previous point, if you're an international organization working in a fragile environment, you are obligated to do it. If you are a Ukrainian working in this context, you have an entitlement to demand it, that this is the certain way in which you should be working here because we're in a fragile um, war affected context. Uh, context. Um, and finally, you know, so you have to do it. What, what does it mean? And there's some very, very good practices. I, I, I won't go into the details of all of these things, but it does mean that everybody who is working in uh, the environment has to have a good understanding of the various uh, drivers of conflicts at, at the level um, at which they're working. Two, it means that every actor has to place themselves on that conflict, con uh, conflict map. That means that there has to be a priori an acknowledgement that you are part of this context and that you're not implementing some kind of intervention which is by definition benign and because you're meeting essential needs and all of these sorts of things. And, and all of these things can get, just come in. It has to be acknowledged your relationship to the people in this context. Um, and, and, and number three, you know, and what, what results to that, um, is a risk analysis, which I think, you know, nobody wants to hear about risk analysis. It's everybody's least favorite part, I think, of doing these things. But if you, if you look at uh, standard practice um, in development, a risk analysis normally looks at what are the risks to our activities? What is it that could happen that could stop us doing our project, which we have a contract for? Well, a conflict sensitivity informed risk analysis is what are the risks that we pose to relations um, in, in the context in which we're working at. Okay, and, and that's putting at a very, at a very simple, um, at a very simple basis, because there's lots of other things I think that were articulated yesterday about things that everybody knows on some very profound level about how we have to work, which is prioritizing local ownership, for example, um, and building relations between different groups. And I think you know, th these are all the sort of things that conflict sensitivity really can help you with. Um, and the, the, the last very final point I want to make is that this does not create the solution to anything, because I think a conflict sensitivity analysis doesn't tell you what the answer is, but very often, and especially in a, in a very uh, vulnerable context, actually makes the dilemmas obvious. Because sometimes, you know, there is no solution. Every choice has got its downsides as well. But it's important that everybody is making their choices with their eyes open. And um, sometimes don donors don't want that. And I, I think I've been told that directly. And I say we, um, we've been running these conflict sensitivity things in lots of places. But, you know, if you're put behind the question of, um, I, I can give you an example from Syria, where a community has had no assistance for two months but some of the delivery agencies might be associated with jihadist groups and might steal some of the money. What, what, you know, and then you're in danger of saying you're funding these jihadists. You know. yeah. I, it, it, quite literally, you know, it, it, these are things. But, but I think you know, that, that's, what, that, that's what we're talking about. It, it, in the case of Ukraine, there might be other things which are, uh, which are different, but nevertheless, you know, um, the international community is placed in front of um, dilemmas and they need to be treated, treated um, face on. And um, it, it's important for the international community to not give any doubt, I think, to Ukrainian people that this is in the interest, what we're doing is in the interest of Ukraine. But there are some very difficult decisions and there are practices, there are reasons that, uh, that, that things are done and they can be quite difficult to explain, but it's very important to explain them. And you know, there is an, a structure for doing that. Дуже дякую. По суті, ми почали з того, що ем, вкрай важливо 
І якраз призма конфліктної чутливості для діяльності міжнародних інституцій. І це так цікаво, що ми зайшли не з обговорення діяльності міжнародних інституцій, а з обговорення принципу про те, як вони мають діяти, як вони можуть діяти в інтересах України. І тому, я думаю, так скакнути зараз з іншою, ми наберемо зараз різних тематик і потім будемо зводити до одного. Андрея, можете дати ваш базовий... Uh, thanks very much um, for the invitation. Does, does everybody hear me? Yeah. Okay. Just just to hold a little bit like that. Yeah. Closer even. Okay. Good. Um, yeah. Thanks again for the invitation. I'm happy to to be here to to share my thoughts on this uh, issue. Um, I think. Um, if, if when you read the the title of the panel or and and the the, the larger description you um you're getting a very kind of critical um and, and negative impression of uh international actors and international bodies uh work in ukraine and i think that that is to to some degree um of course uh deserved we're facing uh, a major crisis uh, a war we 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 didn't uh foresee uh, or an escalation uh we didn't foresee and of course international actors all of them the, the whole international community still has to ask itself the question um uh why we didn't foresee it and why we, we, we could not prevent it. Yeah. Um, on the other hand, um, I'm, I'm personally more an expert on international organizations uh, or intergovernmental organizations, uh, so, so not so much for the ones who were or who are kind of in the focus of the critique like the, the uh, um, uh, you, you mentioned the International Red Cross or the Amnesty International, but I wouldn't even here throw out the kit, so to say, with, with the bath. Yeah? So I, I was just yesterday attending um, uh, uh, a talk in a, in a ministry here in, in, in Berlin, and there was a, an architect from Lviv who was very much praising the International Red Cross for coming up in, in a very, very short time with lots of money for, uh, um, for shelters and uh, for new constructions, very unbureaucratic. So there are also those stories, yeah. And uh, I think we are, we are doing a big mistake. Um, you 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 were saying at the, at the beginning that maybe some organizations even deserve to be thrown out of Ukraine, you know, for kind of overemphasizing those more symbolical and and political uh, uh, kind of uh, debates. Um, I think if we look at the role of international organizations. And, and you already see where I'm coming from, right? Uh, in Ukraine, we, we have to get a little bit of the larger picture first. Um, international organizations, it's sometimes, I, I taught uh, international relations for five years in, in Kiev, and, and, and I sometimes have the impression that this is not very well understood yet in Ukraine, is that they have very restricted mandates and that they depend on member state action, leadership, and unity, first of all. And unfortunately, the time of the 1990s, early 2000s, when we were talking about the actorness or agency, even in political science, I'm a political scientist uh, of international organizations, this era is simply over. Uh, I call it the era of perpetuate global governance. Yeah, global governance was the paradigm we were speaking about back then. Now we are living in an era of re-sovereignization. And um, I've worked in some international organizations for some time, and I can really only, I, I was really myself astonished by how much sensitive uh, every kind of employee there is to uh, member states' interests in, in an everyday fashion, by the way. Um, nevertheless, uh, multilateralism or international, the international community has found um, an answer to this governance gap. And, and we have seen that in Ukraine with the invention of mini lateral fora, such as the Normandy format, uh, and um, the presence of the G7 and the G20. They are a consequence of this crisis of the more traditional multilateralism. They are more flexible because um, they do not have a lot of member states or participant states, and they are less institutionalized. Um, and they work not too badly. If you look at the, how the G7 works uh, in Ukraine, I think it's very much praised for its role um, even before the escalation. 
As I said, Ukrainians have every right to criticize the, the OCE or the UN for its role in the country. It is true that the global peace order has been unable to prevent what has happened. But by the way, and here I, I do not agree to you um, uh, entirely, I don't think that the current structure um, was built for preventing wars like that. Um, if you look uh, empirically on the role of P5 states uh, in international affairs, when they attacked another country uh, or um, uh, that's the, they are widow powers. So if they attack another country, the UN system uh, was uh, mostly paralyzed in such instances. You can back, go back to Kosovo or Iraq. I do not have to come up um, with those examples. Um, but here, in this case, it is questionable if this is really, if what has happened uh, 24 February is really the fault of the lack of UN action or uh, OSCE structures. It is Russia which chose to act against the UN Charter and OCE principles. Under such circumstances, both organizations at least were able to act as forums for public ostracism of Russian action, uh, which happened, by the way, for three times, uh, three different resolutions in the UN system since February 24. And this is very important. Yeah? This is very much underestimated in its effect. Um, it, it basically motivated huge parts of the international community to come up with more help for Ukraine those votes. Um, in the Council of Europe, Russia was even expelled as a reaction uh, uh, to its aggression as a member, uh, something which uh, uh, hasn't happened uh, before. It also needs to be mentioned that, for example, the OSCE Special Monitoring Mission did very valuable work from 2014 to 2024 in the framework of its mandate. Um, who made the effort to actually read the reports of the mission could very well understand who was to blame for ceasefire violations and hybrid war activities. The mission was, from my point of view, a valuable cornerstone of the West's effort to stabilize Ukraine and give it time to reform the state, and the result of which we see right now. We also need to see that international organizations played a key role in reforming Ukraine behind the curtain of big politics between 2014 and 2022. I only men uh, mentioned the role of the Venice Commission of the Council of Europe in the, uh, the, uh, the sector of rule of law, uh, the GIZ's work on the most successful reform until now, decentralization, or the UN's role uh, in healthcare reform and overcoming the COVID crisis in Ukraine. Um, also, international organizations did not cease their activities after 24 February in Ukraine. The UN is very active on the ground with uh, uh, international personnel risking its life every day uh, together with their Ukrainian partners. What can be done better? I think um, for now, I would be very cautious in overemphasizing the role of international bodies, maybe except of NATO, uh, in regulating this crisis. Um, as I said before, there is always the international bodies can only be vehicles or extensions of member states' initiatives. And currently, this is where the problem lies. Um, there is a problem, especially with European powers, in coming up with multilateral initiatives, believing in multilateral initiatives, and believing in multilateral bodies as such. Yeah? If you ask me, German politicians have lost simply faith in the Council of Europe or in the OSCE um, as effective uh, mechanisms. Um, I think there is a clear understanding that Ukrainian security hinges most of all on US support, um, but multilateral organizations will have a bigger role once recovery can begin, but that is an issue by itself. Um, I would not entirely though, um, exclude ideas of future alternative multilateral fora providing some form of security guarantees for Ukraine. There was a lot of talk in the past uh, of a new alliance uh, between Poland, uh, Ukraine, and the United Kingdom. Or uh, this is less talked about, but was talked about a lot between 14 and 22, uh, a kind of a new intermare uh, coalition or alliance. Th that seems far away right now. But um, it depends actually on persistent joint threat perceptions and the formation of new security communities in faith and action. And if I look at the Polish-Ukrainian relationship, something like that might be uh, in the making actually. 
I also, um, I, I can see you smiling already, but I also do not exclude uh, a renewal of the Normandy format after the war. Um, because I think, I, yeah, it, it didn't work at, at least from 2019 on to 2022, but I think it worked well the first years. And without it, we would have seen uh, a very much different security situation on the ground. But that takes a lot of initiative. And that currently, I do not see that initiative neither in Germany or in France. Um, I don't think that the United Nations and the OSCE will see major reforms along the lines Ukrainians want. I do not see how Russian isolation, expulsion, withdrawal would serve Ukrainian security. What those organizations will need in order for them to play a role in peace building, confidence building measures is Russia actually seizing its maximalist position first. And that is a task uh, the Ukrainian army is about uh, to achieve already. After such a point in time, um, they have actually a lot of tools so they would have to be reinvented if we actually kind of scrap the OSCE right now. Uh, the OSCE and its instruments, like the Vienna document of 2011, yeah, uh, would have to be reinvented, actually. So there's no uh, need, I guess, in dismantling them. What is needed is um, uh, a change uh, of policies um, in Moscow or a defeat of the Russian army on the ground. Um, Last but not least, the role of civil society and international organizations. Um, that is also a long-standing issue um, uh, in, in, in research and in practice. I guess it's a, it's a question, actually, from my point of view, of resources and political will. Um, it is long understood that international organizations generally need to uh, incorporate civil society on a much larger scale for the sake of their own legitimacy. That's maybe one of the most important gray zones where secretariats and like-minded states could do more in order to push, push member, bigger member states uh, into action. Um, for Ukraine uh, specifically, I think that here it is critical for international bodies to understand the ambition of Ukrainian civil society in comparison to other uh, civil society phenomena, national civil society phenomena in the region, to really play the role of a genuine actor who's not only there uh, or wants only to evaluate things, give feedback, yeah? um, but wants to have a, a true role in the creation of a new form um, of statehood. Thank you for now. Mm -hmm. Дуже дякую. Мені здається, ви зачепили дуже багато моментів, на які у наших і інших спікерів, я думаю, у, і у а, наших учасників є відповіді. А, і я навіть думаю, кому передати, якщо ніхто не проти, я би передала наразі Андреасу, тому що, мені здається, у нього є, ну і у Олі є багато відповідей, я думаю. На, на кого? Хто? Хто хоче перший? Давайте не так. Да, можеш, звичайно. Uh, То я передаю see. слово Олі. А, да, далі, Андреас, Міло, ми тебе залишимо на, на, той, на десерт. Да. Yeah, thank you. Um, first of all, I really want to support the um, idea of Anna to moderate this panel in Ukrainian. I would speak in English just to make a translator's job easier, but that's a great move and take away from yesterday's uh, panels to make Ukraine visible and normalize the use of Ukrainian language and somehow introduce us to the world. So um, I actually want to reflect uh, to Anthony's and address um, uh, points on the role of international organizations uh, and community in this building and stabilization of the crisis. And um, I would divide my speech into two parts, uh, one boring academical theoretical, and second, um, I will be getting to bashing international organizations on a very practical level. So um, actually, a few words about me, I came from academia researching and actually worked a lot on the ground in this building during 16, 17 uh, years and had 
a lot of experience with working with uh, Donetsk, Lugansk Oblast, uh, and also researching the issues of this building. So uh, on the theoretical level, I just want to step back and uh, point out to that situation that we have now, where the, a lot of frustration came from, uh, why we appeared in this point where a lot of Ukrainians and internationals frustrated um, on either side. So how do we understand this building and development um, movement um, for the last 30 years? Actually, it came to the idea that warfare has changed and since the uh, collapse of Soviet Union and um, end of Cold War, um, Western academia and um, international organization uh, took this position that we no longer involving in international conflicts and warfare has changed. We came to the era of um, asymmetric warfare where um, a lot of secessionist uh, movements and um, some sort of authoritarian oppression happens on the ground and that's the problems that internationals have to deal with actually. So the um, framework of this building came to that point that we have to respond to the crisis on the ground that is rooted uh, into the war dynamic um, such as international, um, inter-ethnic, uh, religious, and um, other conflicts within like one society or different uh, groups of society. So we are no, no longer rebuilding international conflicts. And that's the, in my point of view, one of the um, root cause of frustration that now is happening in international community. So, what we're experiencing now is like getting back to uh, good old international interstate conflict that is happening uh, in Ukraine with a full-fledged Russian invasion and act of aggression. So <clears throat> the academia and internationals have to roll back and redefine what are we responding to. And I absolutely agree uh, that um, there is no magic wand, actually, and international organizations, um, they cannot like, stop the conflict. And at some point, I think that was the expectation of a huge uh, number of Ukrainians that someone, we need help, please come and stop this. That's, that's, that's where um, some claims and... Um, requests from Ukrainians to close the sky, which is uh, for internationals uh, may sound like very childish and ridiculous, but that, um, that claims and requests of Ukrainians, I think came from the point where, um, where there was a lack of understanding of the mandate and responsibility of international community. And I think that, <clears throat> we um, now at the position that um, a lot of uh, population in conflict, in crisis, they, um, I'm usually, <laughs> I'm saying that now every Ukrainian is getting an MBA in conflict studies during this war uh, in our own experience with a huge cost. And that's the second point where frustration came from because a huge number of people just learning what are international organizations for, what is peace building, what is ICRC or uh, UN. And actually, here comes a lot of questions from people who were no professionals at this sphere. And now we have like uh, build uh, overnight experts in the uh, international response, uh, conflict studies, development, and actually war studies. Everyone in Ukraine now knows the very, very rigorous specification of missiles and very uh, numerous um, names of um, MLRS and um, other multiple rocket launchers. So that's a huge ex expertise for internationals to deal with. And here comes a lot of questions. Um, 
So uh, a huge number of people learned that there is ICRC. So what ICRC is doing and why uh, people are donating a lot of money to that. So actually, it's like very basic questions from uh, non-professionals in the sphere for us who are working in that area uh, for a long time. It may be very obvious, but that's the point when we have to reinvent and uh, rethink how do we answer to those questions. And uh, actually, international community now is answering to like very, very basic questions uh, that Ukrainians ask. Um, Right, um, and I would say that these answers are coming to reality and a lot of frustration, like third point of, of the frustration came from the um, lack of understanding of uh, context. We knew that all that uh, we have to build local ownership, uh, build local peace and understanding uh, of the conflict dynamics uh, and, and like context that, that internationals are working with. Um, but there was huge underestimation of Ukrainian institutions, uh, the development of the democratic institution and infrastructure when um, the full-fledged invasion started. And we appeared at the point where uh, the organization that hasn't uh, working in Ukraine, they came to, to the scene and um, were actually applicating the uh, tactics and practices that were relevant to, for example, some uh, countries in Middle East or Sub-Saharan Africa. And I think it's very obvious, but I cannot uh, like hide this, uh, that there was a, um, a lack of understanding of local context and actually uh, that uh, Ukraine has developed and built uh, not ideal, but very good um, established and working um, governmental institutions and as well as built uh, social cohesion on a horizontal level to that extent that it like self-sufficient and very active and very resilient. And for example, um, some there, there was like like two uh, types of international organization that who's been working in Ukraine for like uh, last eight years and somehow know what the what the capabilities of the country, what the capabilities and um, capacity of the civil society in Ukraine, and those who only came to uh, to country and like was doing their research and exploring Ukraine at the same as they were implementing activities and. Um, that might be um, the point <laughs> where internationals got the frustration, but I think there is an answer to that. That um, and an, an answer will be um, understand uh, the country you are working in, um, understand the uh, level of development of civil society, governmental institutions, and a um, level of cooperation, and some. I think the good answer to what strategy should be uh, taken by international organizations is let's uh, evaluate the, the context and evaluate the uh, um, challenges that we are facing on the ground and not work on the uh, sporadic um, level but work more on the strategic level. So, and maybe instead of like bringing water to a Vinita region, international organizations can think how can they contribute to the long-term development of the strategies of recovery for Ukraine. Дуже дякую. Дуже дякую. А до речі, у цей момент дійсно про перехід і про думання вже зараз про пролонговані програми. Тут ми я розумію, що ми тут говоримо як про дію на міжнародній арені та різних організацій, і при цьому ми також говоримо про дію цих міжнародних організацій в різному ключі зараз в Україні та також над стабілізацією далі. І теж ми бачимо велику потребу, ну і зокрема як гуманітарна організація, дійсно в в більш такому поєднанні гуманітарного і розвиткового і в довгих стратегічних напрямках, які вже зараз потрібні. Не тільки стабілізація, але і розвиток. Отже, 
і відновлення. Андрея, спросимо. Є дуже багато до чого тепер звернутися, але можете говорити, що хочете. Do you hear me? Yeah. Well. Yeah, thank you for inviting me. Um, uh, as um, Hanna already said, I'm working for the Center of International Peace Operations here in Berlin. We are sort of, um, we attach to the German government dealing with international peace operations of all kinds, but we are also sending civilian staff um, to peace operations that Germany basically provides as an in-kind contribution. I'm working in the relatively small analysis unit uh, in that center and my sort of regions are Ukraine and Southeastern Europe. I've been myself on mission, basically working for the UN in Kosovo for seven and a half years. So that's my practical background. So I will sort of zoom in on the question of international peace operations. If we come to that question, how can international actors contribute to reinstating peace and stabilizing the country? And um, let me let me maybe start with a somewhat sobering answer. Um, I don't know. Um, I don't know yet, I must say. And, and why is that so? That is so because very much will depend on the further um, outcome of the war and what we will have as preliminary states and possibly as end state of that war. That fairly much determines what international peace operations will be able to do there. Um, when I talk to German audiences, sort of um, very often sort of the, the topic that I start with is expectations. I don't know, I don't know how it is in Ukraine, but in Germany, sort of, if you talk about peace operations, the first thing that comes to mind of most people is blue helmets. Yeah. yeah. And of course, that it is a very typical type of peace operations that, that you have United, United Nations troops with blue helmets sort of somehow um, guarding, guarding a ceasefire agreement or a peace agreement, but it's by far not the only type of peace operations. You have a far range of peace operations. You have seen that in Ukraine already, where you had three peace operations in the, in the last years. Uh, none of which had blue helmets on. Um, and um, you also have very different organizations sort of deploying peace operations. The UN is only one of those organizations, by the way, and I think uh, you mentioned that before, an organization where uh, Russia has veto, which is in, in, the, in the case of Ukraine, <laughs> particularly important, um, but you also have the OSCE again, uh, an organization where Russia has a veto, and that has become a very practical problem in the case of Ukraine. Um, but you also have the European Union, but you also have, for instance, peace operations by NATO. Yeah, both in Kosovo, the fairly small Kosovo protection force, but also sort of the in Afghanistan, uh, the resolute support missions, um, where both NATO operations that sort of because of their character and, and their international mandate are considered peace operations, yeah. Um, but you also have peace operations that are solely civilian in type. All the operations that you had in, in, in Ukraine so far are civilian missions. You did not have any military missions yet. Um, um, and so maybe sort of after, after sort of this, this initial sort of point on sort of the, the various types and, and, and scopes of missions, um, let me just sort of zoom in on what we had in, U in Ukraine so far over the last years. There was one peace operation called the OECE Project Coordination um, uh, Unit. Um, it's probably the one that sort of gained least international recognition or it was a small office. They had projects ranging from demining to sort of constitutional support. 
but it's something what was called the peace operations according to our um, um, definitions. Um, unfortunately, this one, like like most OCE missions, needed to be prolonged. Sort of, they needed to renew the mandate uh, in summer, and sort of that sort of um, was killed by Russia's veto. So we don't have this as a peace operations anymore. The OSCE found a way to work around that. They found sort of interesting OSCE member states, sort of who were willing sort of to take over the projects. And um, the, the, the Polish chair of the OSCE um, appointed a special envoy sort of who is running the operation. It's the same person that's, that has been the head of mission so far. So that's one way of maybe you work around um, sort of um, vetoes and so on. The bigger mission that, that you're all aware of is, of course, the, the, the monitoring mission of the OCE with um, sort of mandated 1,000 civilian staff. They were all civilian, uh, civilian international staff and, and then sort of some, some uh, 500 uh, Ukrainian staff in addition to that. Um, and, you know, they had to be evac evacuated um, after February, after, after the attack. And they could also not be, that mandate could also not be renewed after um after after march um this year um due to the russian position um but to be honest most of what the activities of that missions were were sort of obsolete anyway yes yeah? sort of the mission i mean it was deployed um sort of to monitor the the situation all over Ukraine, but through the Minsk agreements, it got the mandate sort of to focus on the ceasefire in the east. And of course, there is no ceasefire to to monitor anymore. Um, but of course, you could could think of a mission, be it OSE or another one that might monitor a ceasefire in future, if there is a ceasefire, but only then. Um, The third mission that you have been having in Ukraine is the European Union advisory mission on the reform of the security sector. It's, it's, also, it's also sort of a peace operation, sort of according to our definition. And that, that mission could simply continue its work, of course, with all the difficulties through evacuation, sort of, um, but sort of in principle, it could continue its work after February because the mandate by the EU is not dependent on the Russian position. And you, you could also see sort of that this mission, and, and that was a political decision in the European Union, um, could change its mandate adapting to the actual um, uh, circumstances right now. That is sort of they got an additional task supporting the Ukrainian institutions in prosecuting um, uh, international crimes, sort of war crimes, yes. So if that is a new task for that mission, so the mandate changed and the mission continues to work in Ukraine. And then sort of the final one, um, the European Union has now just um, installed a military advice, uh, assistance mission for Ukraine, which quite unusual for European Union operations is not sort of deployed to Ukraine, but works mainly in Poland and in Germany, sort of um, uh, educating, assisting, uh, sort of um, um, training uh, Ukrainian soldiers sort of um, for their resistance fight. Yeah, sort of that is a new type. But you see already in sort of the four that I mentioned are very, very different types of peace operations and sort of with circumstances changing in Ukraine, one can think um, about um, uh, additional types, but that really sort of depends on what we will find as an outcome, but it also depends, of course, on the political will, um, sort of, of the mandating institutions and of the cap capabilities of the mandating institutions. Yeah. Um, one thing that I, for instance, can think of is, um, in addition to sort of um, uh, missions that we have right now is yes, in case there will be a ceasefire at some point or peace agreement, a monitoring mission might make sense again. 
um, we can also think of transitional presences of a mission sort of in case sort of territories presently occupied by Russia are transferred um, under a political agreement, not sort of by fighting uh, uh, sort of uh, through fights, but sort of by political agreement at some stage that you might have a preliminary presence by peace operations there sort of that allows for an orderly transfer. Again, it's an option, but only if the conditions are right. Um, one can think of a, a mission um, uh, sort of um, guarding and securing the area of the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant, but that will be very, very difficult to achieve, sort of a mandate for such a mission, because that basically would require the agreement both of the Ukrainians and the Russians. You cannot fight your way there. Um, um, but sort of these are things that you can creatively think over, again, if conditions are ripe for that. And I think at, at that point, I just leave it, might give you sort of some stuff to discuss or to, to ask questions. Um, but sort of, yeah, here we are. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thanks a lot for listening. Put on your because I will... <laughs> Resume a little. So. <laughs> да. Бо хочеться трошки підвести тут, та, типу, знак питання, не, точно не крапку, а якось і відреагування на, на те, що Андрея зговорить, на те, що Ольга говорила, якийсь момент про те, що дійсно у вже існуючих інституцій є досить багато різних варіантів а, діяти в залежності від того, як ситуація буде розвиватися. Якесь воно потрошку вибудовується, оце можливість, що дуже важливо, по-перше, знову ж таки, реагувати на контекст, по-друге, це вибудовувати довіру дійсно з інституціями, які є в Україні щодо того, та, для того, щоб ще більше реагувати на те, що насправді відбувається. І знову, та, скрізь ним каменем ми говоримо про мандат, і про спроможність, да, наскільки ми спроможні діяти відповідно до мандату. І також трошечки розказати хочеться про практики того, як а, наразі працюють прямо, прямо на землі, на землі організації а, спільно, і яку роль, наприклад, також а, різні структури ООН зараз мають а, в Україні. Може поділитися Міла, а, яка з нами є з, з України, з Дніпра, з офісу, бо я його впізнаю, Ліонова з Карітасу Донецьк, в Дніпрі. Тобто це Карітас, я б так коротко поділюся, це Карітас переміщений. Карітас, який в 2014 році був переміщений з Донецька в Дніпро. І це виходить такий перший переміщений Карітас. Зараз у нас десь п'ять Карітасів, які переміщені, наприклад, Маріуполь в Черкаси і так далі. Але таким цікавий досвід і цікаве місце. Міло, прошу. Доброго дня усім. Я дуже рада бути тут хоч онлайн, але це, це дуже для мене важливо. Дуже дякую за запрошення. Як Анна сказала, я знаходжуся в місті Дніпро. Я комунікаційна менеджерка Каріта з Донецьку в місті Дніпро, а також я піс-інженір. Тобто до миротворчої діяльності маю безпосереднє відношення. І знаєте, мене, можна сказати, життя готувало до того, щоб... Цю війну зустріти, зустріти таким чином, як я зустріла. Да? Дніпро знаходиться, знаєте, якщо подивитися на Дніпропетровську область, то вона як на півмісяць обігнута да, цим прифронтовою лінією з Запорізької області, з Миколаївської області, поряд Харківська область, поряд дуже Донецька і Луганська область. І коли почалася війна 24 лютого, в мене була звичайно можливість, як у багатьох людей, евакуюватися до іншої країни, але я лишилася тут, у Дніпрі, тому що, знаєте, багато людей в Україні зберегли себе, допомагаючи іншим. І коли ми бачили, як важко іншим регіонам, коли ми побачили цей потік біженців, який просто потоком величезним пішов до нас, то це було найкращим варіантом, як це б не звучало, можливо, дивно, бути на місці, залишатися на місці і допомагати людям. І саме миротворча діяльність одразу в Карітас включилася буквально з перших днів війни. 
тому що біля Карітасу, про який знали всі, і Донецька, і Луганська область, тому що наші офіси Карітаса, вони працювали на нулі, і ще після першої хвилі. І тому біля нашого Карітасу вибудували, буквально вишикувалася черга сотень і сотень людей, які потребували допомоги. Ці люди потребували просто елементарно їжі, ці люди потребували прихистку, ці люди потребували гігієни і всіх абсолютно базових продуктів, яких в них не було, тому що вони тікали просто. І е, ми одразу, е, знаєте, е, цю чергу, е, в цій чергі, звичайно, почали виникати конфлікти, тому що ресурсів в перші місяці було недостатньо. І одразу ми почали працювати з людьми як миротворці, мої колеги, інженери порозуміння, які підготували якраз, до речі, дуже вдячна, Міністерство, іностра... Міністерство закордонних справ Німеччини, а також миротворчі організації ПАКС, яка вже почала в Україні дію свою ще кілька років тому і підготувала досить велику кількість таких кризових спеціалістів, які почали працювати з першої війни тут і допомагати людям. Ми почали працювати елементарно, надавати людям підтримку, емпатію. Ми, ми почали додавати людям ясності, ми почали просто обіймати людей. І ці люди отримали разом з гуманітарною допомогою, вони отримали набагато більше. Вони отримали розуміння того, що вони не просто переселенці, це не просто ярлик, це не просто людина, яка м- м- втратила все, а це людина, яка отримає тут допомогу, яка зможе е, отримати тут старт у нашій області і надію на те, що все можна змінити. І е, в Дніпрі е, одразу, буквально через кілька місяців, е, е, почали організовуватися такі хаби з міжнародних організацій. Я можу сказати, що Дніпро ніколи в житті своєму не бачило стільки міжнародних організацій, стільки міжнародних партнерів, стільки іноземців, як це е, є зараз. Е, одразу ж у нас організувався офіс ООН ОЧА, це координаційна гуманітарна місія, і е, почалася дія на, звичайно, на таку е, швидку допомогу, екстрену допомогу, да, тому що люди потребували просто їжі. Просто води, просто прихистку. Е, і, звичайно, для, як для міжнародних організацій це була е, нова, абсолютно е, нове, да, от ця співпраця з Україною, тому що приїхали спеціалісти, які там працювали в Африці, працювали на Сході. І е, для цих міжнародних організацій дуже важливо було розуміти контекст. Для цих міжнародних організацій дуже було важливо е, отримати таку м, експертизу да, от, і м, допомогу в налагодженні містків з різними місцевими організаціями, з органами влади. І Карітас е, виступив таким гарним і надійним партнером в тому, щоб ці зв'язки вибудовувати. Тому що е, з перших місяців війни е, ми почали проводити е, платформи, на яких ми об'єднували е, локальні організації, які почали да- надавати допомогу переселенцям. Е, ми е, почали просто елементарно знайомити організації один з одним, для того, щоб вони стали видимими один, одні для одних, для того, щоб не дублювати допомогу, яка надається, і для того, щоб ділитися тими ресурсами, е, які ми маємо. І таким чином, поєднуючи таку, знаєте, ми, по суті, почали виконувати, власне, ту роботу, яку виконує зараз от координація ООН ОЧА, але на нашому рівні, і... Тому для ООН ОЧА був дуже важливий наш досвід і дуже важливий, важлива та підтримка в інформуванні, взагалі в знайомстві з нашими українськими реаліями. Я дуже слухала попередніх спікерів і я розумію так, що на національному рівні є багато на задоволення і що, можливо, підтримки замало говорять, можливо, що, що співпраця 
ведеться, можливо, не так, як хотілося б, да, і нам хотілося б дійсно бути більш видимими, але на прикладі Дніпропетровської області можу сказати, що якщо ти ведеш переговори, то ти можеш це змінити. Якщо ти співпрацюєш і сам виходиш на цей рівень переговорів, то ти можеш спільно з партнерами змінити все. І от буквально за ці кілька місяців ми спільно з ООН провели три заходи у таких областях, як Харківська область, Запорізька область. Я вчора якраз приїхала з Запоріжжя, також у Дніпропетровській області де ми знайомимо наші місцеві організаціями з принципами роботи ООН, з принципами кластерної системи, яка зовсім нова для України, з принципами нейтральності, з різними да, от гуманітарними важливими е, е, моментами, які, про які в Україні не знали і... Можливо, ми б і щасливі будемо не знати да, цих принципів всіх, але зараз ми знаходимося у війні, і ми це просто для того, щоб залучати цю підтримку фінансову, ми маємо з цим всім стикатися. І ООН займається зараз не просто координаційною діяльністю у нас на місці, а якраз от за допомогою таких партнерів, як ми, Карітас, і ще інших локальних партнерів. Ми просто знайомимося, знайомимо організацію один з одним і, по суті, займаємося такою, знаєте, розбудовою нової згуртованості нової згуртованості, і ми навчаємося один у одного. Як міжнародні партнери у нас, так і ми в міжнародних партнерів. Мабуть, те, що дуже важливо для нас зараз, крім того, щоб бути видимим, я спеціально подивилася за день до цієї конференції російські новини. Мені було дуже цікаво, як зараз описують війну в Україні. Я побачила цей принцип навішування ярликів. Російська пропаганда працює дуже гарно, особливо для свого населення. Вони називають нас українськими націоналістами, вони нас знищують, вони повністю роблять з нас, знаєте, таке осередненого усереднення таке, да, таку масу для того, щоб нас, про нас думали як про щось таке середнього роду. Тому дуже про... хочеться, щоб міжнародна спільнота розказувала живі історії, тому що ми набагато більше, ніж ярлик. Ми люди. Я особисто, в мене є син, якому 5 років, я залишаюся в Дніпрі, я постійно знаходжуся під обстрілами, і точно так ж, як і мої е, сотні тисяч, да, мільйони е, українців, які тут знаходяться, ми живі люди. І нам дуже хочеться, щоб нас бачили набагато ширше, ніж цей ярлик, який намагається навісити на нас Російська Федерація. Е, ми також дуже важливі, і е, я дуже вдячна саме журналістській міжнародній спільноті, яка зараз е, працює у нас. І буквально е, цими тижнями у нас працював е, фотограф, е, він являється військовим фотографом, е, який приїхав саме для того, щоб показувати ці факти, живі факти. І е, е, саме показувати життя. Um, тому uh, для мене, мабуть, дуже цінним є те, що uh, є ця співпраця, є дуже багато, і дуже багато міжнародних організацій зараз складають фінансування, дуже багато допомоги, яка надається зараз усім тим потребуючим uh, людям. Uh, які є у нас, uh, тільки в Дніпропетровській області зараз знаходиться 340 тисяч переселенців. Uh, це за офіційною інформацією. А в моєму Дніпрі в місті знаходиться десь близько uh, 140 тисяч людей. Тобто місто ну, дуже збільшилося. Так от. І... Ми зараз маємо, знаєте, будувати таку нову реальність, 
збільшилися люди, ці люди відчувають себе, звичайно, втраченими, да, от через те, що вони втратили своє житло, втратили, можливо, своїх близьких, втратили своє життя, минуле життя. Так от. Тому спільно з міжнародними організаціями ми зараз думаємо про те, яким чином не просто давати людям гуманітарну допомогу, а яким чином підтримати людей психологічно, яким чином е, згуртувати людей, щоб вивести людей, е, із, знаєте, не садити людей на гуманітарну волку, а щоб люди перех... вміли самі вже переходити із стану жертви е, в стан людини дорослої, в стан людини, яка може е, взяти життя в свої руки і будувати його на новому місці. Звичайно, за підтримки партнерів, але е, і в собі бачити ці сили. Тому що для нас дуже важливо, щоб Україна була сильною державою. І, звичайно, Україна починається з нас, з людей. Тому зараз ми в цій війні бачимо такі, знаєте, для себе шанс не тільки відбудувати свою країну, а й відбудувати нас самих, відбудувати нас як націю, відбудувати нас як сильну державу. І тому ці миротворчі практики, вони зараз дуже важливі для нас, як для будування цієї згуртованості нашої. От, ну, власне, дякую. Чи, 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 там, да? чи там резюме в кінці ще? Не? Дякую дуже. Дякую, Міло, дякую за ділення якраз такою практикою того, що відбувається прямо на, а, в, і взаємодію. Я також спілкувалася з колегами. І дійсно, на, наразі відчуття якраз від очі і від цієї гуманітарної місці, ООН, з якою ми співпрацюємо, що вони набагато більше зараз ну, саме працюють в контексті співпраці з організаціями. Є позитивний вплив теж цього. Але при цьому ми також говоримо, що, в принципі, наприклад, От досвід Дніпра, що гуртування почало ще до того, як прийшло туди. Да? Там, і, ну, прийшли, прийшли тоді міжнародні, щоб гуртувати знову. Але оце от обмін, насправді, принесенням якогось міжнародного досвіду і міжнародних практик, він може спрацювати, але тільки в моменті та, аналізу ну, спільного розпрацювання в контексті, коли можна дивитися, що в нас працює, що в нас не працює. Ми не будемо зараз обговорювати приклади, коли не працювало, да, от про воду сьогодні згадали в Вінницькій області, або да, коли пшеницю роздавали, теж, або той в, а, коли роздавали їжу, ну, тобто не борошно, а пшеницю роздавали в нас таке в 14-му було. А, от, і вона потім лежала окремо, <хи> нікому не потрібна. І тут ще момент у цієї синергії, це також от момент якось про згуртованість синергію, про те, що важливо ем, між гуманітарними діями, та, між політичними діями, е, між, не знаю, там, е, оцими е, е, Peace Actions, да, про які розказували, тобто якісь військові дії між різними діями різних інституцій, тому що дійсно в одному уряді одної країни одне підрозділ буде займатися гуманітарною відповіддю, другий буде думати про військову відповідь, і не, між ними не завжди буде взагалі хоч якийсь зв'язок а, про те, а що відбувається. І ми в якийсь момент дійшли теж про те, що Дуже важлива гуманітарна допомога, вона економічно зараз стабілізує, ну, тобто і допомагає економіці України, і допомагає людям вижити, але при цьому, ну, я, мені ця фраза, на жаль, подобається про те, що, на жаль, продуктовий пакет війну не зупинить. Тобто робота з наслідками – це дуже недостатньо, і це точно те, що має бути в увазі, але те, що ми можемо зробити з самою війною, має бути на увазі, може, ще більше, ніж попереднє. Ми маємо ще трохи, так, трохи маємо часу і для запитань, і для, може, реакції на відповіді одне одного. А, тому, так, а, будемо по черзі, по черзі підняття рук, і Оля буде в загальній черзі. А, от, тобто перший, а потім Катерина, потім Оля, так, там ще немає, а то потім ви. Отже, так, і я віддаю тоді мікрофон. Thank you very much. My name is Anastasia Juravel. I represent a European non-governmental organization for the protection of prisoners' rights and 
during the speeches of the speakers, I have written a small speech of mine that I would like to present now because I have a very strong reaction to what has been discussed here today. And um, first I would like to emphasize that uh, me, I studied international law and I already had a lot of uh, disappointment in some of the provisions and rules how, of how it works, but now we see in practice how far we are from the aspirations of those who founded the United Nations, the Council of Europe, and so on and so forth. But I would like to remind everyone that we have international law, which is the set of rules, including use cogens and erga omnes, which cannot be violated. And if the state does it, then there should be responsibility for those violations. And if we say that we cannot adequately react to the violations of international law of the state. We as an international community, as international organizations and the states, if we are referring to our restricted mandates and lack of possibility and lack of empowerment, then probably we should reconsider the rules that are governing our international organizations. Maybe we should widen our mandates. Maybe we should reconsider international order to make impossible now and in future such violations because we thought that uh, after the second world war there would be at least a couple of decades maybe forever but not forever unfortunately some peace on the european continent now we see that this has not happened and maybe maybe we should reconsider once again what was wrong. Maybe we should work on the mistakes that have been done during all this period, because international organizations have proven their inability to implement the provisions that were once decided. Those provisions look very nice in theory, very nice in paper, but we also need strong action to implement those provisions, not just to declare them, because then this is not international law, that, that is like a fairy tale. And also I would like to say that um, if we agree with the mediocrity in what concerns international crimes, in what concerns torture, deportations, if we agree that that can be happening in the 21st century on such a wide scale with genocidal intentions, then what does it tell about our own mandate? What does it tell about our own usefulness and effectiveness in reality? I would also like to say that uh, definitely the emergency, the ad hoc initiatives, all the support that has been provided to Ukraine by international non-governmental and international intergovernmental organizations were of such a scale and this cannot be neglected definitely. And we are very thankful for everything that has been done. But we also understand that this unfortunately is not enough, but that is the direction in which we should go. And we should be more, we should be more strong in our own demands to the Russian government, to all other governments as well. And we should continue in that direction and not go the opposite direction. We should not say that this um, has been like, like a specific case. This should be the rule. And from what we see, the support of the Euro Ukrainian refugees and the resentment of the refugees of the previous waves in Europe, we realized that it was not enough for those people who were fleeing Syria and Afghanistan before. And we understand that this standard of support that has been given to Ukraine should be from now on the standard for support of, for all refugees. And this is how we should act as well on the European scene as well. Thank you. Да, да, дякую за за ваш стейтмент. 
Katrina. Yeah, Hannah, thanks a lot. My name is Katrina Hertel. I work uh, with Civil and Plus uh, at the moment, uh, but actually the majority of my career, almost like 10 years, I had been working with international institutions in Warsaw, in Kiev, uh, between Kiev and Den Haag, you know, so. <laughs> Um, uh, so basically, uh, with that, I just want to mention that uh, I kind of, uh, you know, had been uh, on, on both sides in a way, you know, and I see that specifically vis-a-vis -vis this topic, uh, there is no, of course, object objective judgment and a lot depends on uh, where you come from, yeah, so when, when we listen to some remarks of the civil society of yesterday, vis-a-vis uh, -vis work of international organizations, it's, it's a one tone, uh, today's tone is a more balanced tone, uh, and I also enjoy it a lot, you know, and the experts' explanations, and uh, it also brings a lot to the understanding of the mandates, the restricted nature of the mandates. Um, I mean, I may be not uh, very um, uh, popular um, among my civil society colleagues when I say this, yeah, even though I'm uh, with them, with all my heart, you know, with these critics of the international um, uh, institutions uh, and the responsiveness, etc. But I think there needs to be also a certain uh, kind of expectation management also on the side of civil society and civil society actors and national authorities in Ukraine vis-a-vis -vis, uh, this kind of uh, uh, operation, this modus operandi of international organizations, yeah, and this limited nature of the mandates, which is not necessarily a bad thing. It also uh, makes uh, international actors uh, have an expertise, uh, uh, like, you know, like tailor um, an expertise and uh, uh, be able to, to concentrate uh, and uh, be, be impactful in, in, in maybe not hundreds of areas, but in something very specific, you know. And uh, uh, yeah, so I think this expectation management also on the side of civil society is very important. And uh, it's uh, even more important when you think about this enormous uh, homework um, many of us will have to be engaged in when you when, when we talk about the recovery of Ukraine, uh, reconstruction of Ukraine, modernization. This is not going to be possible only by civil society. Uh, this, this needs to be uh, really like done in a synergy uh, with international institutions uh, relying on international assistance. And I think in that way, civil society also needs to kind of, you know, be aware that despite the very limited mandates, how, um, uh, how can uh, uh, international Actors be beneficial for Ukraine, yes, and how can can uh, there be more uh, stronger cooperation between civil society and international institutions? Uh, this is uh, just my general comment, and then I would like to ask um, you, Andreas, because I really liked your concrete uh, um, kind of ideas about different missions uh, 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 with different mandates by different institutions, what's possible, and you mentioned there several options, but after the ceasefire is established, and this is, of course, uh, understandable, but uh, uh, do you think that there is a possibility to launch a mission even until the ceasefire is in place. I think this is also something that uh, uh, is at root uh, kind of as a root cause uh, for critiques uh, of the current modus operandi of different international organizations, that there is not much impact uh, uh, onto uh, kind of approximating the ceasefire, yeah? So do you think this is, is this is in any way possible by any of the international organizations or some kind of a hybrid, you know, like, I don't know, military missions that could really like approximate the ceasefire. And also another question, uh, considering the EU integration and the candidacy statute status of Ukraine, do you think there is a need for like an additional kind of EU mission or an, a more transcendent EU presence in Ukraine to support this kind of uh, uh, implementation of reforms and uh, uh, yeah, to support this kind of uh, reform agenda as part of the of the um, uh, EU accession? Thanks. Yeah, Дуже дякую. І саме цікаво, що це як, як знову зворотня відповідь до попереднього доповідача, да, тому що ну, ми, по суті, не наче біжджимо одне за одним в часі. Тобто, чим, більше, чим в тебе жорсткіше мандат, тим більше в тебе стабільності, як структури. І це дійсно досить гарно, коли ти маєш типу, якісь зрозумілі рамки, в яких ти працюєш. Але чим більше в тебе зрозумілі рамки, тим повільніше ти можеш змінюватися. І тоді типу, ми думаємо про мандат в той час, як у нас відбувається геноцид. І це, тобто, це дві реальності, які типу, вони абсолютно просто з різних, з різних світів. Андреас, через те, що було пряме питання, я передаю вам, а далі буде від Олі. Yeah, thank you very much for the question. Um, 
for maybe I start with a with the second one, an additional EU mission to support reforms. Um, I think the EU can support reforms in Ukraine through ma in through many ways, and it's not always a mission that is the answer. Yeah, sort of. I mean, you use peace operations only where it's really essential, sort of, to to have a typical type of presence. Um, and and I mean, you see, sort of, there's the delegation, there's sort of all this Ukrainian support group, and so on. Um, so I don't think sort of to support reforms in Ukraine sort of that you you would need um, an additional mission, you have one sort of to support the reforms of the security sector, I think sort of security sector is always very close sort of to to hard hard security hard government security that's sort of why the EU decided to 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 um, deploy a mission um, on that sector. Um, again. Uh, yeah, one can, one can, one could think sort of that the mandate of that mission sort of develops further, um, but that really depends on the needs on the ground. And I don't sort of want sort of to speculate and only say sort of for the sake of an argument sort of that you need another mandate. And it's, it's something sort of that that would probably need to come from Ukraine uh, to say sort of we, we really sort of want to have more support. Um, in additional areas. Um, and again, missions before ceasefire, um, very difficult. I mentioned that that example sort of, um, um, and, 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 and again, I don't think it's likely sort of to get the mandate for that, but one could think of sort of creating a protection zone around uh, the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant. Um, that could well be sort of before a general ceasefire, but you would need to have a local ceasefire sort of to, to make that happen. Um, there is a very, very rare type of, um, of international peace operations, sort of military peace operations, sort of that enforce, that enforce sort of um, a peace fire, a, a, a ceasefire. Um, but I think that is very unrealistic under the present conditions in Ukraine. Um, you would need a, a decision of the Security Council for that, um, uh, and you don't get it. Um, it's, it's, it's the sad truth. I would completely agree with you. Yes, we need sort of to, to, to have more demands on, on the international legal system, but I think it's more sort of like probably that you get there sort of in smaller steps in, in various areas, sort of there's not the grand, the grand design where you get what you wish. Yeah, very, very unfortunately, I think sort of your old president Kravchuk is right. Maimo, she, she maimo. Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a great existential comment uh, and quotation of our ex-president Kravchuk. Yeah, we have what we have, and that's actually a great um, sobering point. So we have to face the reality and the modality of work of the international institutions. And actually my point, I want to get back to like very uh, boring uh, theoretical stuff. I think pretty much all of the panelists were talking about their uh, own understanding of peace um, in terms of like peace building and peace keeping uh, operations and different like very precise missions. And I just want to frame it in the this very academical and uh, as well practical paradigm that we have like three different um, application of um, peace. So we have peace making and that's a very, um, challenging uh, task for a translator to translate it into Ukrainians, uh, into Ukrainian, because we don't have this like uh, apparent um, terminology in Ukrainian language. But internationally, we use like peace making, peace keeping, and peace building. So this is like three, uh, three, um, uh, three lateral um, essence of the peace, and it's like very. Uh, chronological um, order in that. So peacemaking missions usually are launching during the conflict to, uh, to, 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 to make this peace agreement to, 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 to protect and to, to act on the ground and to establish the 
ceasefire and some sort of like stop of kinetic fighting. Uh, peacekeeping missions uh, usually go to protect what have been achieved and uh, peace building that a lot of practitioners in Ukraine are talking about uh, usually goes after ceasefire, some sort of peace agreement or military defeat. So there should be like hard security established on the ground to talk about peace building. And I think to, today we talk more about, um, like Andreas talked about, like very precise uh, peace uh, keeping operation. And um, a lot of colleagues and people in the audience referred to peace building. And actually, um, I think at uh, the uh, end of our discussion, I want to point out to the elephant in the room and uh, say that terminology and words that we are talking about uh, current uh, Russian war in Ukraine uh, are very valuable and actually peace become very triggering word to Ukrainians and that because of like history behind uh, and eight years of uh, very um, not explicit um, um, narrative about uh, war in Ukraine. Only now at the eighth uh, year of war, we um, achieved the point where international starts to call it out war and call the um, um, actually the precise uh, terms. So I think that um, what international organizations uh, on the different side of uh, like for this building from peacekeeping from like security um, a sector can do is like listen to Ukrainians and uh, be careful and conflict sensitive and be careful about the words that we are talking about uh, this war. And uh, actually I think it will be a good practice. So every new international organization coming to Ukraine and start its activity in there uh, will have a disclaimer that we recognize the Ukrainian ambition and goals uh, in this war. And we don't want to put anyone um, at the table of negotiations, and we will let Ukrainian decide what the outcome of the uh, war will be. And I think this will be a good um, place to start the work in Ukraine to assist people to do what they do. And actually, like one last final point about uh, your passionate comment about international rules uh, and uh, international law and rules of war. Actually, we have to face also the reality that um, the democratic uh, global world is fighting and having um, um, trying to build some sort of uh, relationship with a country that absolutely neglect international uh, law and weaponized actually this international law. So that's the new reality we have to think about. Mm -hmm. There is no answer in, in my comment. Mm -hmm. Так, дуже дякую. Ми наразі маємо дві хвилини по другій. Ми почали типу дві п'ять хвилин по. Я пропоную нам розділити ще типу ну максимум п'ять хвилин разом. Типу, якщо ви не проти, для того, щоб завершити, для того, щоб піти, бо да дуже багато недоговореного. Та і ви були якраз на черзі, тому я ділюсь мікрофоном з радістю. Прошу, але давайте там будемо потрошку прискорюватися. Дякую. Мені здається, коли ми почали цю розмову, ми не зробили головне, ну, як інтродакшн, що ми маємо розділяти чітко гуманітарну функцію, яку виконують міжнародні організації, і політичну функцію, яку виконують міжнародні організації. І моє особисте розчарування щодо діяльності міжнародних організацій полягає саме на виконанні їх політичної функції. І, ну, як вам сказати, ми бачили Маріуполь, і це був онлайн-трансляція, 
вбивства людей, і ніхто на це не міг вплинути. Це був жах. Потім е, ООН не могли вплинути на те, щоб ми вивели, хоча б Україна вивела, хоча б решту людей, які змогли вижити з Азовсталі. Ми це бачили. Потім ми бачили Оленівку, де утримувались наші е, військовополонені, і що там сталося, і ми не знаємо, і доступу немає, і ООН нічого не може зробити. Згадаю ще зернову е, зділку. Да? Дякуючи Ердоганові, щиро, і я думаю, що частина населення Азії та Африки теж мають дякувати Ердогану за те, що в них нема голоду. Але не ООН, на жаль. Тому е, зараз, якщо ну, це, це виклики, це виклики, ми бачили ці виклики в Сирії. Не працюють механізми, не працюють процедури, значить їх треба змінювати. Розумієте? Треба змінювати. Якщо сьогодні немає альтернативи, тому що право, Росія має право вето в Раді безпеки ООН, або має право вето в ОБСЄ, Має бути якась альтернатива? Ну, я, приміром, хоча б за те, що якщо не працюють ці інститути, давайте створимо постійний спеціальний трибунал, який буде хоча б карати. Але він буде постійно діючим. Його не треба буде скликати по кожному окремому випадку. Випадків, на жаль, багато. Лише Україна не одна. Розумієте? Тому... От я би хотіла от на це звернути увагу. Дякую. Дуже дякую. Та ви, по суті, в кінці сказали те, що там можна було на початку почати. Та. Ви праві. І е, оскільки, так, я не знаю, чи тут є непереборне бажання, типу, одне непереборне бажання, ну, є рука, так, тому що та, ми, це вже час обіду. Я також бачу непороборне бажання у Ентоні щось сказати. Не знаю, чи Андре, бо Андре <сум> теж. А, та... Ні, тоді Ентоні в кінці буде завершальним. Ваше Ентоні і ми. Few points that I really like during the discussion uh, from several speakers. One about uh, um, making ourselves uh, visible as a civil society organizations uh, to to find the synergy and actually like share the resources, and uh, also um, like uh, uh, look forward and uh, uh, not only focus on the humanitarian or this uh, uh, stabilization, but also uh, uh, looking towards the development development mental role or the um, reconstruction, actual reconstruction. And I uh, just want to bring up uh, uh, another like sector of international organizations, international financial institutions, uh, because the, um, like the, fin the sums uh, for rebuilding Ukraine uh, is uh, immense. Uh, and uh, we as a civil, civil society organization also need to participate in those processes as well. Um, and we have right uh, to do that. You know, the, uh, the transparency is like, uh, is crucial uh, even in the time of war. Uh, so that is just like a comment from, from my side that these processes are also happening. And if we want to rebuild back better, uh, that's also another sector to uh, have our eyes on. Я дякую дуже much. Дякую дуже. А, Міло, ти нічого, якщо ми тобі не дамо слово, бо не маємо часу. Я тільки зрадала, що у нас ще людина з України є. Все окей? Типу, ти ок, бо немає часу. Все добре? Та, не, не бачу, не чую реакції. Добре. Тоді я даю слово Ентоні, і, по суті, він буде підсумовуючий. Але так, типу, те, що громадянське суспільство має не просто брати участь, а спільно розбудовувати Україну, це в нас буде велика битва, насправді. І не тільки з міжнародниками, але й з нашими державними діячами, на жаль. I, I, I want to uh, just make one point, which might be quite cross-cutting, um, is, is that um, I, I definitely, you know, looking at systems is what we have to do, you know, also the development community. 
as a sector, as a professional sector, it, it's about how can you build systems that sustain international peace, that allow sustainable development in, in a systematic way, so that you're not dependent on you know, the goodwill of individual people. The, the system has to work, and, and, and what we've seen now is a collapse of the system. In any kind of planning, I'm, I'm, somebody could correct me, but I can't think of a system that sufficiently takes into account power inequalities in a way where the disempowered can have the voice which they have on paper in order to contribute to whatever it is. Okay, You can see the UN system actually gives more power to the biggest security actors and actually formalizes their already power inequality and allows them to legitimize what they're doing through that system but it's very very hard to find a system that will bring the small voice and bring it on the level with the other ones who you know on paper should be equal in in that discussion um and and um i i think you know people do think of different structures about how you might do this and some work better than others um but it, I, th I think it's something again if we're talking about the relationship between internationals and uh, ukraine um, it, it's just something that I would say is really, really important for internationals to think about. And it is important to think of yourself as a partner and be aware that you actually possess the resources which are essential for the people to, to rebuild the country. I'm always quite embarrassed when I hear a presentation like somebody from Mila who would say, well, th you know, it's important to say thank you to all our donors and sometimes it's written in our contracts. Your donors should be proud of the work that you're doing in actual fact, they should thank you. And it's not thanks that you should, you should be giving them feedback. Is it flexible enough? Is it sustained enough? Um, is it clearly enough defined into how it can be used? Is it appropriate to things? That, that, that's the relationship because this is a partnership relationship for uh, dealing with a very serious problem. Um, and um, yeah, I, I think I'll, I'll, I'll just leave it at that, yeah, is that this is a partnership for dealing with this. And um, we, can, we can all see what's written down and how it should be, but there are power relations that, we, that the more powerful need to be aware of you know, when I'm talking to somebody, are they just telling me what I want to hear in actual fact, or can I do both? So um, that, that, that's my closing word. И тут тоді мої сам прямо заключні. Я поділюся зараз на назву і так з думаю про те, що сказали учасники, про те, що тут дуже не вистачає ще третьої сторони, про яку ми говоримо Росія, і про те, що ми дійсно живемо в світі, в якому одна країна повністю знущається над міжнародним правом і над тим, і реально його використовує. І ми в цьому поговоримо про Україну, і ми говоримо про міжнародну спільноту, у якої є як і політичні, так і гуманітарні, і інші способи взаємодіяти. І оцей от момент того, що може дійсно, тобто ми готові працювати над зміною мандату, запрошуєте, як за що-що. Дуже вам дякую, дуже дякую за участь і гарного обіду.